Good afternoon and welcome to Living Out Front. Out Front Columns is monthly podcast. Today we are so fortunate to have Senator, State Senator Jeremy Wallace with us to talk about the state of equality in, in here in Michigan. And uh, Jeremy is an old friend of mine. He goes way back and it's, uh, we, we were joking beforehand it's been too long since we've seen one another. It's almost like there's been a pandemic in the way or something. So, Jeremy, how about you introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Amy. I really appreciate the invitation uh, to join you. It is good to see you virtually and hopefully sometime soon in person. I'll have to make it over to the west side. Uh, but I'm uh, the state senator here uh, in the southern portion of Oakland County. So I am in my hometown of Southfield. Uh, I represent to, a little bit to the west of Southfield in Farmington and Farmington Hills, and my communities go to the east of Southfield, uh, including uh, Oak Park and Roloke Township and Lathrop Village and Huntington Woods and Ferndale and Pleasant Ridge, which is a really core uh, center of the LGBTQ community here in Oakland County, right. and Hazel Park and Madison Heights. And I am the first openly gay candidate to be elected to the Michigan State Senate. Uh, and John Hoadley and I were, were the second openly gay candidates to be elected to the Michigan House when we were first elected all those years ago. So uh, uh, I'm happy to be here with you. Well, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to have you on today. And congratulations on being the uh, highest elected openly gay official in uh, our legislature. Yep. So, it's well deserved. You have a long, long history of advocacy um, before you entered politics, even. And the constituencies you serve um, are indeed part of the core of the largest population of the LGBTQ plus constituents in our state. Um, what is the state of equality in Michigan? What what is what? Where do we fall on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the best and one being the worst? Well, we're certainly not 10, and we have a lot of work ahead of us, um, and we're not one, uh, but things are progressing forward. Uh, what I'm nervous about is complacency. What I'm nervous about is people think, oh, things are so, so great for the LGBTQ community. We had a wonderful Supreme Court ruling. Uh, last year that that helped out with workplace discrimination protections, you Hopefully. know, marriage equality, that fight is passe. You know, I'm nervous that people think we're at a 10 and that brings us back down to a five or a four. Um, we still have a lot of work ahead of us, specifically here in Michigan. There's several things that we're still pushing forward on, namely an amendment to our state's civil rights law, the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act, uh, to protect the LGBTQ community here in Michigan from discrimination in employment, in housing, and in, and in publicly available services or accommodations. Uh, that Supreme Court ruling that extended federal employment protections based on sexual orientation and gender identity was key. It was important, but it wasn't all encompassing, didn't protect every workplace, um, and certainly didn't allow for those to seek remedies in our state civil rights law if they're discriminated right. against in the workplace and didn't touch housing and didn't touch services or accommodations. So you can still be evicted. Uh, you can still be uh, de uh, denied services. You can still be kicked out of a, of a, of a public venue uh, if you are LGBTQ in the state of Michigan. Uh, and we, are, we have our state civil service commission uh, that has decided we're, regardless of the state law being silent on LGBTQ rights, we're gonna pursue these claims of discrimination uh, but that's just the Civil Rights Commission's prerogative. We need to put it in state law. We need to protect every Michigander based on their sexual orientation and gender identity in the law to ensure that when they're discriminated against based on who they are, how they identify and who they love, they have a place to lodge a complaint. They have a place to seek justice. And that's, that's just not the case here in Michigan. Um, mm. And to that end, we need to put LGBTQ protections in our hate crimes statute. When these egregious uh, targeted 
uh, acts of violence, which particularly impact trans women and trans women of color, um, continue to occur, there needs to be a special designation that we call it what it is, a hate crime, so that it deters folks even more from targeting a protected class. We need to put uh, sexual orientation and gender identity in our hate crime statute as well. Absolutely, I agree with you. The remedy that's closest to the constituent is the best and therefore a strong state civil rights uh, an amendment to our state civil rights act which is actually a really well written piece of legislation just uh, it's missing uh some core constituencies um would be the holy grail here in michigan i think it's only actually been granted a hearing a couple of times in the last 10 years right uh, right and 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 for the very first time, and, and I'm 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 this firm subscriber to this Harvey Milk notion that coming out is the most political thing you can do. Coming out where you, where you work, where you eat, where you shop, to your family, to your friends, to your coworkers moves the needle more than any other thing you can do. It's mm -hmm. it's it's being your authentic self is more important than any statistic or any data sheets you could show somebody. And so by being, I'm the first person on the Michigan Senate floor to talk about the LGBTQ experience from an LGBTQ perspective, I think it's made a difference. And, and I think it has allowed for Republicans to have conversations with an LGBTQ person that they've never had before, that maybe they've never felt comfortable having before. Maybe it's just never been in their face like I'm in their face. Uh, and so for the very first time, we have a Republican Senate co-sponsor of our efforts to amend that Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act in both the, in both the House and the Senate. Uh, and so it's, it's a demonstration that this is about humanity. This is about caring for your, your fellow neighbor, your, your family member, your community member. Um, this does not have to be an R or a D issue. Um, th this, this is an issue that transcends partisan politics just to protect people who face this historic discrimination uh, and need to seek remedies about it. So um, we are kind of in this watershed moment where we've turned a corner. I've said this many times, you know, when John and I, I think when we were first running for office, uh, the, the risk was being an openly gay candidate, an openly LGBTQ right. candidate. Now the risk is being an openly homophobic candidate. Uh, and, right. and so, and so we want to, we want to keep this momentum going and, 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 and have more pro equality legislators from whatever party that they may be, but we need more pro equality legislators uh, in the state of Michigan. Right. And that means more, more of you, more out LGBTQ legislators. Also. Absolutely. Um, I'm fir firmly behind you with the, uh, you know, the best way to educate is to make your case for humanity. And um, it's surprising the, surprising how attitudes can change once you're not thought of as an abstract concept, you're seen as a real person, a living, real, warm blooded, breathing person who has this, who is entitled to the same rights as everyone else. Exactly. And, and, and I'm a Democrat. I'm proud to be a Democrat. Uh, uh, and I also work across the aisle. I, I have a, a, a bill that's going to kind of renew and reinvigorate housing, our housing stock in the state of Michigan. I'm working with Republicans on that. Uh, I'm part of a bipartisan bill package on police reform after all of these incidents that we've seen in Michigan and across the country. And I, and I, and I work with other colleagues on economic development. <laughs> and I'm gay. And I think they realize, you know, we're not so different from one another. I, I, I share the right. same core beliefs uh, that, that transcend party politics, that we need good housing stock, we need safe communities, and we need to grow our economy. And I'm a gay person who does all those things. Um, right. So I, I think that is what moves the needle more than anything. Right. I do all those things. I just happen to be gay. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I know in 2014, the last time that ELCRA, Elliot Larson Civil Rights Act came up, uh, an amendment came up for hearing in the state 
state house, there was a Republican co-sponsor on the House side, but not on the Senate side. And so being able to move the needle that much is really, um, it doesn't sound like a big win to a lot of people, but it really is a big win. And I applaud the efforts that both that you and those who have come before you in, in the, on the House side have, have done. I appreciate that. And, and, and it's, and it's, it's, it's not just me showing up. It's not just me being in the Senate. It's, it's community members living their authentic selves, showing up where, where they are in their communities. I, I mean, I know you are active and engaged and, and out there mm-hmm. um, and, and, and in every corner of the state, you know, there are Jeremy Mosses and Amy Hunters and, and, and others uh, that, that really dispel all these lies and these stereotypes and these myths about gay or trans people um, and, and our entire community. Uh, and, and I think it's, a, it's a very, very important um, for folks to continue to live authentically um, because that's, that's the best way to get these issues moving forward. What's a good way for, say, a trans person like me to, to get a meeting with your legislative aide or even a meeting with you, let's say we'll use you as a hypothetical um, person that I would like to have see co-sponsor an amendment to ELCRA? That's a really good question. Um, so there's a pre-COVID answer and a post-COVID answer, uh, and hopefully mm-hmm. we're going to get to more normal times. But showing up at coffee hours is just the best way to reach your legislator. And I, I kind of talk about this as like the hierarchy, if there's a pyramid, like the hierarchy of, uh, of reaching out to your legislator. The, I think the worst way to reach out to your legislator is social media. Uh, you know, we get a lot of social media messages. We get a lot of Twitter DMs or tagged in tweets. Um, you know, it's advocacy in a way, but it's not the best advocacy. You know, the next level up is, is personal contact either by email, or by phone call, um, uh, or, you know, uh, actually reaching out, you know, I'm so-and-so from your district. Um, uh, Here's an issue that's concerning to me and and my community and and, and my neighborhood. Um, But the, but the top of that, the top of that pyramid, the, 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 the peak is showing up. And so I'm engaging in outdoor coffee hours, just uh, Mm -hmm. in this this time that we live in. Um, And, and, and that's the best way to, to talk to me, and, and legislators all across the state do engage in, in, in community town halls and coffee hours. Um, and, uh, and, and hopefully most of them are doing it in a safe way like we are here in my district um, to talk about these issues directly and to have a real direct dialogue with your legislator. Um, and I think that is the best way to reach out to somebody to make your voice heard. That's, that's really great advice. And at the same time, you know, you you get to educate perhaps some other constituents that are there with other issues that they want to speak to their legislator about. I just remember so, that we had a we had a Southfield coffee hour probably a couple of years ago, and we we're talking about Elliot Larson, and this woman just said, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa! You can be fired just for being gay." And I said, "Yeah." Yeah. Didn't even know, didn't even know that was a concept. And I think that's kind of one of our biggest hurdles um, in our community is people say, well, why do you want these special rights? You know, why do you want more than, than, than other people have? Why do you want special attention? We're not asking for anything more than anybody else has, but we're not Mm going to accept anything less than equal protection under the law. Right. Exactly. So there have been some smaller wins here um, in the state itself. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, uh, for instance, the case that was that was fast-tracked through the Court of Claims to the state Supreme Court that um, was, was brought by the Michigan Civil Rights Commission. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that our Attorney General, Dana Nessel, is going to argue this case herself before the Michigan Supreme Court. That's exactly right. So, so, so the, the main thing is, is ensuring civil rights protections for the LGBTQ community, ensuring civil rights protections that you're a protected class based on your sexual orientation or gender identity. 
Um, we're trying to do that legislatively. The Supreme Court, uh, U.S. Supreme Court, uh, took up uh, that Bostock case uh, that was kind of looped together, which included Amy Stevens, uh, a, a trans woman right. here in Michigan, uh, that 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 made it to the Supreme Court that said, you know what, sex discrimination is discrimination, uh, or sexual orientation, gender identity discrimination is sex discrimination. If I were a woman who was married to or fell in love with a man, I wouldn't be discriminated against. But because I'm a man who has attraction to men, I am discriminated against. And same thing with, 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 with trans identity, um, that, it, that somehow if you were cisgender, you wouldn't be discriminated against, but because you're transgender, you are. So the Supreme Court, US Supreme Court has identified uh, that sex discrimination does include discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Now here in the state of Michigan, the same kind of uh, route is making its way up through the court system and is before the Michigan Supreme Court to say that sex discrimination in the Elliot Larson Civil Rights Act uh, is discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. At the same time, we're still moving our bills. We want to be pretty intentional in our language that sexual orientation and gender identity are, are, are protected classes. Uh, but we do have this court case that is similar to the US Sup Supreme Court case making its way uh, to the Michigan Supreme Court. And yes, our wonderful openly lesbian uh, Attorney General Dana Nessel uh, I, I herself will be taking that uh, to, to the Michigan Supreme Court. Uh, and uh, you know, we're, we're obviously optimistic for, for a similar outcome that happened in the US Supreme Court. And then you talk about other victories on a very uh, symbolic level, but nonetheless significant. We had been pushing every June to declare, just to simply declare that June is Pride Month and recognize mm -hmm. the cultural and civic and economic contributions of the LGBTQ community here in the state of Michigan. And every year it just gets tossed into the trash by, uh, by the Republican majority. And we have fought, John Holy and I have tried every strategy every year to figure out how to get it passed. Uh, one year they told us, well, you know, it takes a long time to kind of vet these things and we just don't have enough time in June to be able to adopt it. So that the next year, John and I introduced the June is Pride Month resolution in January. So they could have all the whole half a year to, to vet it. And of course- All they the time they needed. Up. All the time they needed, no excuses. But this past June, finally, we have been unrelenting uh, and they did adopt, a Republican majority adopted my resolution to declare June as Pride Month, which again is symbolic, but it is symbolic. It's symbolic of we're here, uh, we contribute. Right. We're, we're a part of, of the Michigan story too, which I think is pretty significant. Right. A, a part of the fabric of the state that Absolutely. makes Michigan great. Absolutely. And we deserve the acknowledgement of that. Yep. I want to I flip back to the, um, the state Supreme Court case um, for just a second. Why is it important to have, to have even though we, there's a, a, we're cautiously optimistic of a good outcome at this Michigan Supreme Court, let's say the outcome is is what we want. Why is it still important to have that in statute? It's, it's incredibly important. We have to be very intentional with our language and we have to make sure, especially if there's a Supreme Court ruling, which could impact a lot of people, that's still kind of a capture in time. And it's subject to a, a future Supreme Court that might change the interpretation of, of mm -hmm. sex. We wanna be very intentional with our language that in our civil rights law, if you're discriminated against based on your sexual orientation or gender identity, you have, you have ability to seek justice about it. And I talked to my Republican colleagues, again, some of them having these conversations for the first time. And I think there's this notion that like, you know, we're gonna be taking cake bakers and shoving them into the back of cop cars, you know, in handcuffs. <laughs> That's not the case. Right. If I'm fired for being gay and I have proof that the reason I was fired is because I'm gay, I take it to the Civil Rights Commission. And the Civil right. Rights Commission can do an investigation and they can come to conclusions. Sometimes the conclusion is 
a warning, sometimes the, conclu- you know, uh, you know, giving me my job back, but also warning the employer. Sometimes it can be penalties. Sometimes it can be t- training for the, the employer. I, I, I mean, some people just need to be corrected in their ignorance. But it's, it's other people that make this big leap that, you know, somehow we're going to be tearing up people's religious values and we're right. going to be arresting people left and right. That's not the case. And, and, and it's based on due process. It's based on an investigation. It, the onus is on me to prove that this is, this is the reason I was discriminated against in, right. in, in my employment or in my housing or, in, <clears throat> or being served. Um, and that's, that's the justice that any minority group has under Elliot Larson. So Elliot Larson protects people from discrimination based on a number of categories and has for the last 50 years based on race, religion, sex, height, weight, and and other protected classes. We're just looking to add sexual orientation and gender identity to this existing law so that people who face discrimination based on who they are and how they identify and who they love, that they can seek justice too. Right. Absolutely. Well, well put, sir. So at the same time, we've had some other little wins um, recently. There was an opinion by the attorney general around birth certificates. And by the way, I, even though I was eligible for many, many years to have my birth certificate changed under the old statute that required a surgical uh, affidavit, I didn't see how I could possibly do that when there were so many people that could never afford surgery or couldn't have surgery or didn't want surgery. Right. And so now, uh, now that policy has been changed. Um, and I was one of the first ones to, to get it changed under the new self attestation. Well, that's a hard word to say. Never say that word on a podcast. <laughs> So um, self-identifying policy, that's a big win for the trans community. And it's a win that, that is, cannot be, it may seem small to a lot of people, but it's a big win for the trans community because the birth certificate lies at the base of, of the pyramid for, so, for all of our legal documents. Just think about all of the, the things that, you know, the driver's licenses, credit cards, places where you would uh, have to out yourself if you didn't have a birth certificate that matches your authentic self. So it was, it was, a, it was a pretty emotional moment for me the day that the certified copy came in the mail that said Amy Louise Hunter sex female. And um, I know that 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 there are a great number of other trans people that are going through the process now of getting their their sex designators corrected. Um, There's also been some movement on Medicaid and that they will be following the World Professional Association on Transgender Health guidelines now in uh, making claims for um, Medicaid insurers. And that's a huge win. Um, when before we had we had a policy that was supportive of of trans transition related care, but didn't enumerate in any any regard what pro, what procedures were uh, recommended for trans people, what procedures were medically necessary. And now they've got a, a roadmap in place. That's a big deal. So we're making some progress other than, other than the, the great progress you've made with Elkra. Yeah, no question about it. Um, and this is kind of like a tag team effort from our wonderful uh, Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benson, and our uh, esteemed uh, Attorney General, Dana Nessel. Obviously, as you mentioned, Dana Nessel affirmed that your gender identity is based on how you identify regardless of, 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 of any medical procedures you may or may not have. And, and this was part of this was propelled too by Jocelyn Benson. She came to Ferndale, which is in my district, actually Affirmations, which is 
um, the LGBTQ Community Center over here uh, right. in Oakland County uh, to make an announcement that if, how you identify is how your sex is going to be on your driver's license. And you got to kind of think about what is a driver's license? A driver's license tells you two things. It tells you you're able to drive. And, it's, and, and it is a depiction of the person and how they identify so that somebody knows that you're the person who is able to drive. So if you identify as male or you identify as female, that should be what is the depiction on your driver's license. Absolutely. And it should, be, it should be no more complicated than that. If you, if you are a, a person who identifies as a female and that is who you are in your driver's license, you want people who utilize your driver's license for identification purpose to know that you are female. And so it, 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 people who make it way more complicated than it needs to be uh, are missing the point. It, this is, this it affirms who the person is and how they identify. Uh, and, and, it is, and, and it is significant for that person. And so I'm sure uh, when you saw, you saw your documents uh, and it, it affirmed your gender identity, um, it was meaningful. It was important. It, 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 was, it was an affirmation that the state of Michigan recognizes your identity as well. Right. Recognizes me as my authentic self. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, well, Jeremy, this has been a real pleasure talking with you. Uh, I hope to see you, Senator, on this side of the state sometime soon, perhaps as the uh, Delta variant takes its bow out. Right, um, right. And start getting back to normal. Uh, in the meantime, maybe I'll come to that side of the state and attend one of your coffee hours and give you a hard time. We'd love to have you. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thanks for reaching out, Amy. I can't say, can't say enough what a pleasure it is to have had you on, Senator. So have a safe Friday. Have a safe weekend. And this has been Living Out Front with State Senator Jeremy Moss. Mm -hmm.